I've been told that, um, that Enola's here, so um, Ruth, you want to come on up here and um, take over this? Here we go. So I'm going to introduce to you um, Enola Maxwell. We, we, uh, we just heard uh, June talk a little bit about the, the Molicons at the neighborhood house. And here's the executive director of the neighborhood house, and Ruth Bassin, the editor of the here. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Ruth Passon, and you know, and I've been working together for a long, long time. <laughs> I'm Toro Hill, but um, Enola has history here is longer than, than mine. <laughs> so, um, first off, I'd like to ask Enola where you lived when you first came here, or if, where you lived when you raised your family, including. <laughs> well, my youngest daughter was born on the hill in 1950. Oh my God! <laughs> I came. I moved here a few months before that. Uh, we lived in the uh, Carolina Street Housing Public Housing Project. And that is no longer here. It's where the junior high school is now. But that's where we uh, moved to when we first moved to. That's the Petrero Hill Middle Petrero. School. Yeah. Those Middle of you school. that don't know. Yeah. And what was it like? I mean, did, did, most of us think in terms of public housing as being pretty much um, uh, mostly black and, and mixture of eth ethnics. Uh, was it like that when you were living here? Or in that? Yeah, this particular housing was all black. They had. Uh, different public housing. Public housing itself was not all black, but blacks lived in one area in one place, and whites lived in another area in another place, and browns lived in another area in another place, and yellows lived in another area in Chinatown. So they had them all over, but they had special. You know, it wasn't the integrated housing at that time when I first came. Things haven't changed much then. <laughs> well, it's, well, I would say they have changed because we do have uh, black homeowners outside of public housing. At that time, if you wanted to, some people wanted to buy a house, but you couldn't buy a house, a black person on the trail of health. So there was no uh, black home ownership was not possible at that time, but now it is. So things have changed. As a matter of fact, it's, you can live almost anywhere regardless to what well, it called the British Law, but you just don't have the money or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Still can't move that, but it's not the segregation, it's the life of the down payment. And the monthly notes, you know. The first house I bought, I didn't, I, I got the down payment, I didn't know about the rest of the <laughs> Were you a member of the Olivet Presbyterian Church at that time? That's the church is at Missouri and 19th, for those of you who don't remember that. But now it's called Goat Hall Productions, which is a theater company. Uh, but Olivet Church belonged to the, the neighborhood house. Own the uh, church owned both properties. But were you a member of the church at that time when you were living here? Well, I used to be Baptist, you know. And then, you know, uh, you know, Presbyterians, rich and white, so you didn't belong to a Presbyterian church if you were black. But if you were young children, my children, they, they're the first ones who went there, you know. I didn't want to mess up because I knew that when, uh, usually, normally, when white people go in, white people go out, and I didn't want to run any white people away with the money because I didn't have any money to support the church with, so, I, you know, I wanted to keep them that because they usually accept children. Uh, but uh, my kids went there to Sunday school and they joined the choir. And my uh, son was the first card carrying member of the Petrero Hill Neighborhood House because they too did not accept black people. 
They didn't accept Jews either, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't that discriminating. <laughs> Do not apply. <laughs> so, but my kids start going there, and I found Third Baptist Church to be further and further away, and we waited on the bus, and the ministers kept coming down, you know, inviting me to join. And uh, then we started visiting the special programs that they had with the children, my mother and I. So we went visiting and kept visiting. So they told me, oh, I said, you know, I didn't see any rich, wealthy white people. That's so I said, my God, these people don't look like they have any money either. So I thought that maybe it wouldn't be nothing they would lose if they happened to leave. There wasn't many members or nothing else. So I decided that if I was going to church at all, I'd go to that church because it was right up the hill from where I was living. And Third Baptist was oh, a long, long way away. So uh, we were persuaded to join. Now, I almost didn't join because, you know, these Presbyterians, they believe that, in, you know, everything that, whatever happens is God will, you know, predestination and stuff. So we, we have these meetings before you join the church, you have to meet and talk about things. So when we got to that predestination, the man told me, that the way it was is the way God, I said, oh no, I don't, I don't join this church. Because <laughs> I just didn't believe that the way things are is the way God meant it to be. So I almost didn't join, but he convinced me that it would be all right if I didn't have to believe that. <laughs> and, and I am so glad a lot of things I didn't have to believe, because I stopped believing a lot of things that I was told I had to believe in the Baptist church, you know. I just didn't believe that either. <laughs> and so I decided that the Father is rich, but it was one thing. Father is rich in houses and land, holds the wealth and will in his hand. We were told that all the time. So, you know, I had to, I found myself, you know, with uh, two children, a single mother. I said, my God, Father is rich in houses and land. So I decided, I went to God and I told him a few things about uh, being rich in houses and land. And I, I, I didn't intend to live in poverty. And, and my father was rich in houses and land, unless he could tell me what I'd done to cause him to disinherit me. So, you know, I've been born a Christian, you know, that people really believe in Christianity. I went to church. First thing, I, place I remember going was church in Louisiana. So it was awfully hard to, you know, give up Christianity when you've been a Christian for that long. So I had to give up poverty. And, and I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I never had any money, but I'll tell you the truth, I just gave up poverty. And, and, I, I, and I was glad I gave it up too, because then uh, in the later years, when my children were six and eight years old, I came to California. And uh, they had told, you know, when you're in the South, you believe everything is peaches and creams, all this equality, all this justice, and everybody's treated alike. But when, when I got off uh, the, uh, out of the cab in front of uh, Buchanan Street, I knew good and well it wasn't the same. It was different. Same thing here as it was in Louisiana. So uh, I was glad that I had not come to this city poor and unfree. Because along with anti-poverty, I gave freedom. I could not be unfree and, uh, and be a child of God. You're a child. Every, everything is about me and all of this good stuff, you know, so you need a part of it. You need freedom. You were born free as anybody else. So uh, I found a lot of things I had to give up to be free. So then I, one by one, I started waking up and just say, my son, you know, we've been in Louisiana, he used to get up every morning, go, and we had porches and backyards in Louisiana. And, and, and the man across the street was a minister of a Baptist church. My son, five years old, get up every morning, he always was an early riser, and go out there and use every cuss word he had ever heard. <laughs> the man said, where did you learn that, Ronnie boy? My <laughs> mama dear taught me. <laughs> and you know, and I learned that now. That's the first thing I learned. I did not respond one time 
never, not one day that that kid come in that house and I ask him why or what and how come. We never discussed it at all. Because I know he didn't get it from me. I just did not use cuss words. I haven't even learned to cuss. Yeah, a lot of times I would cuss if I could, but I can't bring myself. Somebody said, excuse me, Miss Maxwell, use the cuss word. I said, no, honey, that's all right. If I could, I'd do it myself. And thank you very much for doing it. But, but that's okay. <laughs> and so, so that's how I got to be, uh, continue to be a Christian at all of that church. No. Um, but you know, when I start talking, I'm telling you the truth. I need somebody to pull my coat. I don't say anybody tell me to. That's enough. We're all done. We decided we was going to do that, you know. She's going to go on to the next question. Right. Well, no, actually, what I want to do is do transition. <laughs> Because she was at Olivet Church as, as a minister, she went to, to a ministry school and became the first female uh, lay minister there, and first woman black minister at Olivet Church. And so, uh, <laughs> and 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 had become quite a figure in the community. So when I moved to Potero Hill and said, "Well, I'm an activist." Who do I go see? They said, you go see, uh, what were you called? Then? You were called minister? No, you were called reverend? Well, no, good thing the Presbyterians, they just call you by your name. Okay. Sometimes, you know, so that's, that other day, you know, I'm talking about reverend so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. But that, that's, that's how I got, no. okay, but that's I, how I met Enola. And because I was active in a lot of different things, through all that church, I don't want her to tell you the story, um, during the Vietnam War. <laughs> yeah. See, I was uh, love, you all brought, all of that church was a real church, Jesus Christ kind of church, you know. We had everything going, that peace and freedom, <laughs> uh, food, pantry and stuff like that. Black Panthers used to bring us this truckload of food every Saturday morning for the Panther. And we had uh, lawyers there who was working on, on Vietnam, Dr. Violence. And we had uh, the ministers, uh, we had a, a, a whole group of ministers from all faiths, even the Jewish uh, Emmanuel, we went there, Temple. and God, the Temple Emmanuel, we had that. All these ministers was trying to take care of the conscientious objectors, because they had, if they got the protection from the minister, then they didn't have to uh, go to the um, so. My territory was Daniel Webster. We had a lot of young men that needed to stay and teach, you know. So we got them there to stay and teach from Daniel Webster. And uh, it was kind of a nice church. We, we really had a nice, enjoyable time there. Involved with so many things. And Ruth came, you know, these Jews came and one of the ministers. Man, we had a lot of Jews. <laughs> we had a whole minister from. The Episcopalian Church, they said uh, he re did some research and found that he could be also a member of, the, of uh, another church, a denomination. So he came and joined. And Ruth, she never joined, but she was just like her. And one, <laughs> one Jewish friend of ours, he almost joined, but she just couldn't bring herself to join. But she came to church every Sunday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> They're not here anymore. <laughs> and it was really something. And you know, one of the, we'd only had two black men, men in the whole Presbyterian. And this man that I had brought to the Presbyterian got the people to let him go to seminary, let him go to the Presbyterian church in the first place. This man, he was having me investigate. So he, one time he was having one of his meetings. And one of the Jewish brothers was sitting there. See, these Jews, they're no Christian. They can't nothing about no Christianity. They just supported you know. Well, this man was a really good Christian Presbyterian man. He was like Al and, and Al Meadows. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't that kind. And Jew, Ruth, she never did pretend to be no Christian or nothing. But she had a <laughs> Christian and Jewish and none of that. But she was a good art, a 
peace person and uh, could get the artists together. And I tell you, we had the most fabulous art festival at that church. We had every artist in town was there and thousands of people. It was an all day thing. And this was Art Works for Peace. And it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, i give you a little background because on this hill, unfortunately, there were a number of what I would call reactionary people who were against anyone who was against um, things that I stood for, uh, like being against the war in Vietnam, etc. So um, we were kept from having this festival with great artists, in San, the great, you know about the great artists in San Francisco who are having to leave. But we had some of the best artists in, in town who provided artwork for this event and other things. And we got thrown from one place to another and couldn't even have a festival or a, a day of supporting the anti-Vietnam movement. And Enola said, well, why don't you have it at the church? <laughs> really? So we did, and not only did we do that, because she, she, uh, she wasn't a minister there, she was just a lay minister, but she has a way of per persuading people. So, um, but the, but the, uh, uh, the priest at St. Teresa's, and I can't remember who he was at this time, great, he said, why didn't you tell me? We could have done the thing together, which was absolutely beautiful and showed the spirit of the hill that was really there. And uh, the rest of those folks just faded away. And I know it was so early, it was in the night. You know, I got commissioned there in 1968. And Catholics and Protestants were not doing things together. The, the Catholic Church could not come to the Protestant Church, so they could. They had to come in by night, you know, the, the sisters and things. So, but you know how we got to meet together every Saturday morning. They would come over and fix breakfast for us, and that's how we could talk about what was happening in the rest of the world and what they wanted to be involved in, because they could. You could come to the sanctuary. Uh, to the uh, mass, that's where we were living. And um, you could go there, but you couldn't go into the sanctuary. But we got, and then gradually it came the war in Vietnam and all these things happened. You know, you'd be the, the, it brought about so many changes in, in the whole country, in the whole way people do things, like the Protestant and the Catholics. We had this uh, urban ministry, I think it was called, with all these denomination would get together, that's to save these consequences of Catholics, you know. And, we, and, we, and so we, Catholics were there, Jews were there, Protestants were there, and uh, they've been meeting together ever since. It's all right to meet to, for Catholics to go to Protestant churches. Okay, let's move over to how you got into the Petrero Hill neighborhood house. Now that's another. Well, I mean, you get from there to there. But you know, there was a horrible things happening at the church. You know, I tell you, we had, the, we had two fires sitting there, two arsenics. Some people, you know, everybody was not accepted, you know, so they wanted to get rid of that church. So uh, they set this fire twice, and the fire was in the process of, uh, we were in the process of trying to get it rid of it because you know how we did to save the money to keep the insurance up. The kids, we had this youth program also. And the, the youth were not quite as bad as they are now, but some of these bad youth were having, um, would have bingo games. And they would take care of the bingo game and gave me the money. And that's how we kept the church insurance going. And the insurance, uh, then the fires happened. Well, we had the money. The insurance was still in force. So we uh, had the church remodeled and repaired. And then, uh, they, they did it again. And by the time the neighborhood house, I don't know what they were doing for people, but they did have some fuss. People were, the Presbyterian was supporting them and everything. So finally, they uh, really ran out of funds there. So they didn't have any money. And they were talking about, oh, by the way, black people could be on the board. Mrs. Gita, the first black woman, was on the board. And then they elected me to the board. And I thought maybe that if, I knew that if they closed this house down, 
It would never open again because it would be destroyed. And uh, so we fought to keep the house open. The conscientious objectors, they decided that they would stay open. We have 12 conscientious objectors, if you please, by that time. And uh, so they decided to stay far. And those men kept the house up. And, and, and Richard Rynexus, maybe some of you know him, he was there as a theater program. The Julia Theater was housed at the neighborhood house. So naturally, they arranged to pay PG&E a part of the PG&E bill at the neighborhood house. And uh, so that was it. But anyway, we had kept it going. And then I applied for the job there when Mr. Cruiser left because the money was gone and didn't have any money, so they couldn't pay anybody. So, so they were going to have some money the next year, though. So they were trying to get some a director. So I decided, you know, that I would go up there and apply for this job. <laughs> and they, they just kept, this, this place was full of applicants every time I went to have a meeting with the uh, prospective uh, executive director. So they kept putting it off because they really didn't want to hire me. And by that time, people kept gathering and gathering. And every time we went there, were so many people. And then the people that was uh, wanted to get the job, they stopped coming. And nobody was there but Ruth and her gang and, and my gang. And, they, and so the board really did not know what to do. And it was really got so bad. Those men, and one man, he got so angry because they didn't want to hire me. He started walking. He went out on the street. He was scared to stay in because he might get violent. And this other man, one board member, he spit in my man's face. I said, I don't want this job. If you got to come to this, I am not, I don't want it, I don't want it, I leave right now. But it so happened that one of these so-called men that we, you know, could serve, it is supposed to be racist men, say, no, no, you can't give up now. You, you got to keep going, you can't give up now. You fought too hard to give up. And I looked at the man almost fainting. <laughs> it, it, it shocked him. <laughs> That's why you know one thing about it. I do not call people conservative. I don't call people racist. And I don't, and liberal, for God deliver me from them. <laughs> 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 so, and, you know, we got to just look at people. Because, you know, some the best people I know are called, you know, the best people you know, at the, all that church. How I got involved with the Art Commission was Quentin Cobb. Quentin Cobb used to bring his children to the theater every Saturday. You know, are you getting money from the Art Commission? No. Okay, I'll take care of it. He did. He was supposed to be conservative. And, uh, and some of the other, like Francois Black, he was there. I don't think Francois died without ever setting foot in the neighborhood house. <laughs> So you see, it's just not good, this name calling and all of these kinds of things and hating. I'd overcome this resentment of white people. I used to hate them. You know, they love you to hate them in the South because if you, you know, hate is, is bad. You can't be free and hate. So if you, they make you hate them, well, you know, okay, that's going to keep you right down there, knuckling down, segregated and feeling inferior and all that stuff. And, saying a lot of stuff, doing a lot of stupid stuff. So I had overcome that. And I'm glad I did. Before I came to California, I'd given up hate and anger and fear and all that because I was Christian, you know. And to be a Christian, oh, it's so marvelous being a Christian. Christian, you cannot have any of those things. I can't. And be a Christian. So I had to give up all of that kind of stuff. So we came over there to, we got them to not to close the place down and to keep operating with the conscientious objectors that they kept the place open. And then when uh, they got time to hire another person, so I applied for the job. So some of the Presbyterian people told me that would be all right. They wouldn't fight me if I had fired for the job. So, so I did hire them, but it was, took a long time. But eventually those board members came around and they hired me. And, but, some of the neighbors were awfully uh, scared my being there, and they didn't want me there, so they'd done all they could. And then after a while, we had, uh, you know, black people just didn't work there. 
but we had one Spanish man, he worked there for a little while. We had one woman there, she was a social worker, she worked there for a little while. But all those people had gone because they, during the, during the civil rights movement, and the neighborhood house was open up so black people could go and take part in the scouting program and any other program that they had. And they hired this man to be a, a youth counselor and hired this woman to be a social worker. But when they ran out of money, you know how that is. It made the first one to go, so there was nobody there but the conscientious objectors. And the man that was the, the director, well, they couldn't pay him, so he had to go too. So everybody had to go. So we kept on there anyway. So uh, we, did, we just kept the house open. And then eventually in 1972 in February, they hired me. And um, now the army came in. Now the only staff we had was the conscientious objectors. <laughs> 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 And volunteers, you know, like Ruth and Marge and the people that volunteers to come in and try to keep the place up and write a letter every now and then. <laughs> but uh, conscientious objectives were very good in the Army came and wanted to put them all in. The, the man told me from Presidio, he said, Mrs. Maxwell, we don't segregate. And these men, it had come to our attention that they are not doing nothing. They are going to school. They are doing everything. And that is not why they are here. So we will have to put them back in the army because you cannot supervise all of these people. And, you know, and they, they were right. Couldn't supervise all these people. There's 12. Couldn't supervise one. I don't imagine it, let alone 12. So we, what are we going to do? So we had this board meeting. And this board meeting, they were coming around. I asked them each to take a, 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 a conscientious objective, one of the men, and say, and write, and promise the army that they would supervise these men. So they, they did that. And the army kept coming back ever so often to peek in to see how it was going, you know. And the, the men were doing something. They were all good. They had uh, plumbers. One would uh, keep up the, the plumbing, and they called himself the straight thing of the organizer plumbing company, the uh, uh, janitorial service. Straight thing of janitorial service. So they took turns cleaning up the house and doing repairs and things of that nature and kept the place going and, and had programs for the children. And one of them was a very good drummer. He played the drums, taught the kids how to play the drums and everything else. And so um, then we had a fire. Oh. And I, I just remember the fire we had at the church. I said, my God, no wonder these people didn't want to hire me. And we're going to have to get blamed. It was just hurtful that this. But uh, they decided that they could wag with that fire. And they had good insurance, same insurance we had at the church. So, <laughs> so they repaired the, uh, the, the fire. And then we had another fire. This time, you know, there's a, this gas lines right outside of the building on the sides coming down the Harold Street. Well, there was all this paper and cardboard and everything else piled right under that gas pipe. And, uh, it just so happened it was early in the morning, and the uh, newspapers then was passing around, throwing out stuff. So we had to live right around the corner from the fire department, and they caught that fire before it blew the place up. And went over to the fire department, and, and God brought the fire department back, put the fire out. And then these conscientious objectors, I tell you, they had, they just, circulated all through this neighborhood. Let the word go forth if there's ever another fire at the Petrell Hill neighborhood house, this whole hill is going down in flames. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had a fire since. <laughs> um, 
Um, I think we, we could go on, you know, it could go on and on forever. Um, and I know you probably would like her to, however, there's a time limit here. And I think, are you ready to take questions from the, from the oh, yes, let's have questions. Okay, does anyone want to? Wow, way up there. I have a question about the closing of all of that Presbyterian Church by the Presbyterian Church organization. I know there was a protest when it happened. Uh, can you talk about why the church decided to, uh, to end this at the Presbyterian Church and uh, what happened with the protest, how that came about? Well, the Presbyterian Church, as you know, the church period, the churches, they start dealing with uh, all that social stuff and civil rights and all of that. They just pulled in all the money and everything. So yeah, I remember we went over to uh, Grace Cathedral once, right there, you know, those people had always been helping us in civil rights and the peace movement and things. But these, may, I think it was Bishop Myers, he says, we are not, we don't do that anymore. We're not into that anymore. And this was the way the whole church became. And we just went in, back into that old way of doing things. When was that? When did it stop the church? Well, when did this, we, oh, it stopped being a church in 1972. Yeah, that's about right. In 1972, because I was the lay preacher there. And then when I, uh, got the job, the whole thing belonged to the Presbyterian Church. So I got the job at the uh, neighborhood house. The, and then the church was no longer in existence. No longer a church, it was in existence for doing other things. I remember the, uh, who was there at first? After the church stopped? After the church stopped. <laughs> The clownish people that were there. Oh, the pickle, oh, the pickle the family. The pickle family right. certain. Right. Of course. So it was still in people's kind yeah. of services, you know. People, people, people were doing things there. But the pickle family circus was there. Bill Graham? No. Yeah. You are new from I can tell. <laughs> uh, is there another question? In the community, in this city for years and years. Is there another question? Any other? Uh, any other? Right here? Yeah. Uh -huh. Jan? 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 Ostra. Ostra. I don't know. I remember them, but what's the question? I was wondering if you had any stories about that family. No. No. You know, but the Sasoyets and the Leskatoffs and all of those people, some of them used to be the enemy. They tried to get rid of me for years, but, but the, the Leskatoffs, not them, but the Sasoyets. But uh, their house burned down. And the rest of the people gradually, all the rest of the neighbors, they became friendly and helpful. Neighbors helps the neighborhood house, right? No matter how close they are, they're very helpful. They protect the kids and they speak up for the kids and everything. And so we don't have that neighborhood problem anymore. We try to keep the noise down as best we can. So we tell them whenever there's going to be noise. As a matter of fact, June, Pop June Popoff was the last person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, June lives across the street from the neighborhood house. And she's one of some of the neighbors who come and clean the sidewalks if nobody else has and take care of some of the foliage there. I mean, the neighbors have been great and very yeah, concerned. Trim the trees and things like that. They do a lot of things to, to support the neighborhood house that they're supposed to be doing anyway since it's their house and their neighborhood. And they, we tried to, and they help us too. And the city helps us too. They did a quite a bit of renovation there. And it looks good, and every, they're proud of it now, because we have so many people volunteers. Uh, uh, what is it, April and Christmas painted no, Christmas the whole, April. Christmas and April. Painted the place, and it just looks nice, and then Bob and Ruth used to keep up the garden and things like that. Bob and Ruth, they were tired, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, nobody's doing it. 
So, but we had a whole group of about 50 people came out last week and they fixed that garden up. And then we got some money. My son died. My son died. He was about to, to start that garden over there across the street, you know, that lot we have over there, community. And kind of fix it up and try to teach the kids ecology and something like that about this life saving the land and how to garden and how to do things. Well, they were just, he works for, he worked for Youth Guidance Center and he has some kids that uh, delinquents or something that uh, he was supposed to be giving tender love and care. And this is one of the things he intended to try to involve them in. And you know, but the, some of the people in the community, some of the mothers, the parents of these kids gave some money for, to keep the garden going hadn't found a person that would be dedicated to teaching those kids until about this two weeks ago. We have a classroom there. These two are children who would be out of school on the street if they didn't have that classroom there. So it's a public school facility. So one of the, Mr. Boone, he lives on the hill, by the way, and he's going to take over that garden and teach the kids. That's going to be a part of his uh, teaching about, uh, you know, many, many of our kids, they don't, know, they don't bother much with ecology and stuff like that, so he's going to do that for them. We got a dot com group. They're going to get our kids involved in uh, computers, you know, why the place and putting some computers there. We have a woman teach, going to teach them, give them something else to do, trying to bring them up into the 20th uh, century, what, 21st century. <laughs> Because, you know, I teach anti-poverty myself. And, and you don't have to be poor because you don't have any money. And you have to give that up because nobody likes poor people. And in order to ever have money, you know, then they need to uh, learn something. That, and they got to bring themselves up to what's happening now. Get a skill that somebody wants to buy. So there the, the dot com people. What, what is that name of that group that helps us with that? While we fight some of them, these people here, the community accepted these people. We sure was glad because they're going to do some good things for the kids. The oh, well, we could go on and on. But are there any other questions? Because I think we've got to wrap it up. Oh, way up there. Francisco de Haro was the first mayor of San Francisco. Francisco, whoops, Francisco de Haro was the first alcalde mayor under Spanish rule when, San, when Yerba Buena was under Spanish rule. And he had a, his farm, his ranch was where, where de, Haro, de Haro Street is now. And so he lived there and he, Grew, grew animals and stuff. Whatever you do, know, right? Goats. Goats. <laughs> Until the Spanish lost San Francisco, you know, and then and then he, uh, I, I don't know how long it was before he died. But I'm in. I have all along, especially working at the Nave and being on the Harrow Street, uh, looked for that kind of history. So I've gotten a, a nice bunch of history on it, including people who gave me information and I've got it written down somewhere. So if you ever want to see it, okay. I'll share it with you. Thank you. Last question. Do you see something about black panthers in there? What are they going to Black panthers. Well, you know, they used to give breakfast all over the city, you know, all over the, in the schools. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they had all these trucks and things and they would bring in uh, food to distribute in the community. So we call ourselves a food conspiracy. And they would bring in food every week and distribute it to the people in the community. And we, uh, you know, I tell you what the people did. They asked me to be the spiritual advisor. Yeah, I really didn't want to be their spiritual advisor because I didn't believe in violence. You know, Martin Luther King type of person, I told them all that, and I didn't believe in violence. These guns that they take, and everybody knew where they came from, and they come back and get them whenever they got ready. And I tried to get them involved in politics and things, which is a few did. But uh, they kept on, and they insisted I become their spiritual advisor anyway. And you know what I did? I, I, I'm kind of glad and happy about that. 
first time next Sunday morning, I got up in church and announced that I was the pastor advisor for the Black Panther Party. <laughs> 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 well, you see, the church was, our church really was a different kind of church by then. It was, it was exactly Christian type, Jesus Christ, whosoever will, let him come, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but every time I, you know, I went outside to speak, you know, outside in the suburban church, you asked me about the Black Panther Party. So I didn't know what to say, so I said, I said, well, I tell you, if the Black Panthers are guilty of all of the things they are being accused of, they must be in the pay of the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't know that was the truth. <laughs> But I found out that that was the truth. They had more, more, most of the violence and all the mess that was kept up, the FBI was pushing it.